Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Whitepoint. My name is Harshit and I'm the Director of Business Alliances at White Labs. We are a digital agency specializing in SaaS and e-commerce SEO. And what Emily with me today, she's a Chief of Marketing Officer at Avantra. Now Avantra is an automation platform for SAP operations. They help businesses achieve commercial success and competitive advantage by saving time and resources, reducing, sorry, reducing issues and supporting growth. So big welcome to you, Emily. I'm so happy to have you with me today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Right. Now, Emily, let's start with what, how exactly have your journey been in the field of marketing and what led you? Yeah, so I've, I basically, I've been in marketing since I left university. So that's like getting on for 25 years now. And I've done agency side as well as in-house. So I started off in publishing in-house, working on academic journals, actually. So I had a list of ac academic journals that I needed to mark, take to market in fields of like geology and plant science and really exciting stuff like that, that I had no clue about. But it was a really good opportunity for me to really learn the, the principles of marketing. So I went through the Chartered Institute of Marketing program, the postgrad with them, and that gave me a really good understanding of the Porter's Five Forces and the Boston Matrix, all those kind of good, solid marketing principles. Um, and it gave me a really good foundation then to move my career on. So then I wanted to go um, to agency side. So I worked in a couple of brand agencies, marketing agencies, digital agencies, and I ended up heading up the content and the SEO and the PR teams within one of those agencies. And that was really great because I got to actually experience some of the B2C side of business as well. I had some hotels that we were marketing for. I had some, there was an online beauty shop that I was doing marketing for, I was doing their social media for them. So that was a really good kind of eye opener into how does brand play in, in those kind of B2C fields and then actually take that learning on to when I'm working in B2B because moving then into B2B, after that, I went back in house. I took my knowledge of what it was like to be on the agency side. So when I'm working with suppliers, I can understand what it's like from their point of view as well. And the yep. time pressures that you have in agency and the, the really whirlwind and uh, really busy uh, work. If you don't get this work out the door, you're not getting paid. It's that kind of environment, very fast paced. And then I found that actually being able to use the learnings from B2C marketing and take it into B2B, because at the end of the day with B2B marketing, it isn't that much different, really. You're still marketing to people. We'll quite often think that actually, you'll know it's a business marketing to another business. But within those, there are people. You're still, still a person selling to another person and people buy people. So it's really important, I think, as a B2B marketer, especially in the tech space where everything's very overly complicated with lots of jargon, to actually speak like a human and make sure that you're marketing um, still talks the love language of your customers yeah. uh, and looks to how, how can you evoke those emotional reactions in people even when you're talking from a business a business level. So that's what I, I learned from my career. And then in the last sort of, I don't know, eight, eight years, I would say, I specialized in the kind of technology space. I found that I had a, an ability to quickly understand what a complex technology platform or system might do and, and, and what the benefits are for other businesses. So I was able to get my head around those complex kind of scenarios quite quickly, even though I don't have a technical background per se. And so, yeah, I carved out a niche for myself, if you like, within that space of B2B tech marketing, which I really enjoy and I'm still loving it today. Okay. And now because you have been part of an agency as well as standalone brands, what did you enjoy more? The fast pace of an agency life or a much yeah. 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 So I, I definitely think that th there are traits from when I was in the agency model that I have brought with me into B2B in house because I like to treat our marketing teams and my marketing team that I've built up, I treat that as an in house marketing agency. Our clients are our internal stakeholders. And we have, in my team, we have daily stand ups, we have two weekly sprints, we have Scrum. And we do our retrospective. So that's just the same way that um, an agency will work. So you come together every day, you talk about what's going on, what challenges you might have. And then as a team, how can you address those? So I like to think of it as an in-house agency. And I think that's a really good mindset to help the marketing team think about how they bring P their own PR into it. How can marketing 
educate others internally about the importance of what we're doing and why it makes a difference. Yeah. And also I think it just gives an element of fun. I think one of my one of my core values as a person is to have fun. And I think when we're at work, it shouldn't really be any different. We can have fun and still get loads of work done and still do really good things that create amazing results. But we ought to be having fun at the same time, I think. That kind of agency mentality where we, we get together, even though we're all remote, we'll make sure that we get together. If we can go to, for example, we've got a conference going on in Orlando, I'll try and bring my team over there so we can do a bit of a marketing offsite. And also just, just make sure that we get that face time with each other, even though we are remote. I like to think that I bring out that enthusiasm and that kind of agency vibe because I like that fast paced urgency. And it's funny as well, because when I was in agency, I was writing a lot of content at that point. Yep. And I used to really struggle because the designers and the developers wanted that like boom music playing all day boom to keep the energy up. And the guy that owned the agency, he wanted that too, so that when clients came in, they were like, oh, okay, yeah, this is the, the vibe of the agency. It's all really cool. And I really struggled. I'd be like putting my headphones on, listening to Vivaldi classical Four Seasons or something. But then I learned to adjust to it. And now I can't work without music on. So oh. even though I'm, at, I'm at home in my home office, when I'm not on a call, which is actually the majority of the time I am on calls, but when I'm not, I've got the music on in the background because I just like the upbeat vibe that it gives me and I find it keeps me energetic and uh, yeah full of the right kind of positive energy for the day that's brilliant okay now let's talk Avantra uh, I would love to understand and uh, basically uh, can you help us with a brief overview of uh, the business yeah so we're quite a small business where I would call ourselves a little bit of a disruptive brand so uh -huh. we are a smaller player in the market is quite a large market with a lot of different big names but we're we like to think that we're standing on the shoulders of giants we're being able to use the coattails of other people to elevate our position and we can do that by being a bit different we have that ability as we're not a huge great big corporation we can be a little bit more different we can be agile with how we change and tweak our brand and our brand messaging um and so what, what the main thing that we're working on at the moment, actually, with our brand story is trying to help people understand as a value proposition what our um, rallying cry is. So we're trying to create a movement. This is the old world of IT operations, especially SAP operations. It's yeah. manual. It's laborious. It's repetitive. It's time consuming. It eats into your weekends and your evenings. That's the old world, right? And now Vantra is showing you that there's a shift happening. There's a movement, with, especially with AI. Everybody's talking about that now, generative AI and automation. And yep. so we want to bring people on that like revolution with us. So our kind of rallying cry is actually feel the difference. So we've got lots of customers. Some of them we're not allowed to talk about because they're big names and they don't want to give away their competitive advantage. But we want to show that actually, like these other leaders, you're also able to feel that difference in your business. And the difference is better cost operation. So you're able to keep a lid on the cost and not spiraling out of control. You're able to give your team more important strategic work. They don't have to be sat there in a dark room doing boring tasks, which they have to do day in, day out. That can all be automated. And then as a result, you're able to transform your business, do important projects like moving to the cloud or digital transformation. And so really our, our platform is an enabler for other people to be supercharged in their work. And this idea of shifting from what we call man ops, manual operations, to yep. AI ops. Yeah. So it's an exciting time. And I think that as we've been a little bit ahead of our time in a way at Avantra, we were talking about hyper automation about three years ago and people didn't really know what that was. And especially in our space of SAP operations, where everything is quite slow moving, yep. uh, it's, not like, it's not like DevOps, where everything is fast and exciting. So even talking about AI ops is quite a, it's quite a new thing in our space. But we've been able to lead the charge and people are starting to, to recognize the value of it and, and carve out budget to be able to make these kind of investments. So we say one investment, one platform and one single pane of glass to supercharge your competitive advantage with Avantra. 
No, that's brilliant. And uh, while I was going through your website, uh, I stumbled across uh, you're basically helping business save up to at least like thirty uh, percent yeah. in SAP operations cost. Uh, yeah. Can you please elaborate on how your business achieves this and the key value propositions uh, for your client base? So yeah, one one example that I can give you is so we've got a customer called Scott's Miracle Grow. So you might have heard of them. They're big in the US. They have a product called Miracle Grow. And they've been using us for quite a few years now. And there's just one component of our product that allowed them to cut down a piece of work. So it's a system refresh. They were having to do system refreshes um, at the request of the business. And they were doing it about once a month. And it was taking them about five hours each time they wanted to do this new cut of the system refresh for new data. And once they put our product in, they were able to do it in about three minutes. And that also, not only does that save them that time to allow that person to be moved on to other things, it also means that they can give the business that system refresh more frequently. So they're more secure, they've got better data that's up to date, and the business is, is happier because they're not having to put in an IT request and then think, I won't hear from anybody for a month until yeah. I get my request made. So that's just one, one small example. Um, and another example would be, we had a customer who operates smart factory and they were, they had quite a complex invoicing system and it all fed off SAP and they had an issue where invoices weren't being picked up and therefore weren't being paid. So basically they had money owed to them and they weren't able to cash it in because they weren't able to see where these invoices were going. Mm -hmm. So once they put our platform in. They had visibility over what was going on in their SAP landscape and could highlight the issue and find out where it was. And Avantra actually told them where the issue was and can then start to, to rectify those things. So they were then able to save a huge amount of time, but also then generate a lot more cash into the business quicker as a result of, of having our product. And one other thing with that customer actually was that they've got a lot of machinery within their smart factory. And Avantra was able to detect when something was close to end of life. So again, if you've got lots of tooling that's producing a product that's getting shipped out the door, if one of those machines fails for whatever reason, and then you've got to have that machine down until you order the parts and it comes back in again, you're not able to make your product and get it out shipped out the door to then realize that revenue. There's a lot of cost savings, but it really depends on the niche operations of your business as to how our product can really help but that's yeah. the great thing about it is it, it's extendable you can write your own scripts in it so you can basically build your own automations yeah okay i would love to understand like what size of businesses are you targeting what countries you're targeting what's your target uh, i would say our target icp for yeah you? yeah so we we need to be working with companies which have a complex logistical mm -hmm. setup Usually they're multinational and they are working internationally, but also shipping product internationally or having doing business internationally. For example, if you take Coca-Cola as a brand, they've got bottling companies, they've got product that they need to get to various different locations, not only on a consumer basis, but also to establishments like pubs, nightclubs, wherever. And basically... The, the more complex your business is, the more Avantra is able to offer you value. And we always look for companies that have, I would say, probably a reasonable size amount of basis engineers. So basis engineers, that's just the name that's given to people that work in SAP. So the people that do the, you know, keeping the lights on of SAP within the IT team, they're called basis engineers. And you want to have a sizable team so that you know that they've got a big enough landscape that it's yep. going to work for us. Because if you just got one instance of SAP and you're running a relatively small operation, a corner shop or something like that, our product isn't going to be a good investment because you're not going to see the return. So that's what we're doing. We're targeting kind of your large enterprises with, let's say, at least 10 to 20 basis engineers and with a complex SAP landscape where you've got lots of different products, whether that's HR, finance, all the different SAP products within that space. Gotcha. Okay, now let's talk marketing. Yeah, What strategies have you found to be most effective in positioning the brand and driving global sales and marketing efforts? Yeah, this is a really interesting question, actually, because it's changed, right? 
you know, even over, so I've been with Avantra for nearly four years. When I first joined, we were in COVID or we were just coming out of COVID and no physical events were happening. Everybody was just grappling to get to terms with online events and, oh, we better put on our own event and people didn't know how to do it and what platform should we use and how do we communicate with people? Yeah. So when I first joined, it was very much about setting up that kind of online virtual platform. So we use, for example, we used a platform called Bright Talk, which has already got an audience base there. And then you promote your webinars to your segment, your seg segmented audience with oh. keywords and different types of algorithms within that platform. So we went from getting most of our leads and most of our business from physical events to all of a sudden needing to jump onto virtual and sometimes hybrid. We also partnered with third parties that we knew. So for example, for us, we've got big user groups. So in America, you've got ASAG, that's the American SAP user group. And yeah. in Germany, you've got DSAG. So they're in UK ISAG over here in, in the UK. And so all of those sort of partners of ours, if you like, they've got the community. They were already putting on webinars. So we would sponsor those or we would pay to have our own sort of series within that. So that was one sort of immediate shift that I saw coming in here. Then, of course, once people started to get back into the real world and want to see the whites of people's eyes again and actually start traveling, it was very much, wow, the floodgates have opened. We can get back to doing events. And I was quite nervous about doing that because they take up a big chunk of your marketing budget. They're not cheap to sponsor these events, especially when you're talking. So within SAP, their biggest event is Sapphire. And you can spend easily a quarter of a million on a sponsorship package just to, to go and attend and, and be a sponsor. Yeah. And so we really needed to understand how can we make use of that money when we're going into an unknown. We don't really know whether it's going to work for us because the world has changed. Mm -hmm. And um, I was having a conversation with somebody else actually the other day, and they were asking me, you know, what sort of things have changed for you over the years? And I said, if I look back four years ago to the first event that I did with Avantra, even though I've been doing events for years, but just the first event with this company, yeah. we went along to um, a conference in Vegas and with these venues, you have to submit your graphics about oh. six months in advance. They want to see it. They want to sign it off. And then you've got to get it to somebody who's going to build, do the production of the bills of your booze. Yep. So you're working very much to a kind of a deadline. And then when you get to the event, you think, that was six months ago. We've moved on from there. Our messaging's moved on. Or we've, we've changed, especially in a startup environment where you're really rolling with it every day and trying to be agile. And so we turn up to this event, the first one in Vegas and we just didn't have any messaging. We didn't really know who we were. And so I remember we ended up with just like our logo. And then I got our graphic designer to print some just like wood effect board on the back of the booth. And then I was like, oh, it's looking a bit empty. So I went to Walmart and I bought some plants and I bought some of those electric LED candles and put those on the booth. And we had a sofa and a little coffee table. It looked really nice. But everybody was like, well, who, who are you? Are you like a home decor company? Are you like, what are you? And we made the best of that event. And looking back, I think, good for us. We didn't really, we weren't quite confident in our messaging and our value proposition, but we went out there anyway. And we listened to what people, we chatted to people, we learned, we understood what kind of messaging would they want, what makes sense to them, what's their pain point. And now, fast forward on to four years later, that same event is happening this week. It's happening right now in Vegas. My team's out there in Vegas at the moment. And within you know, four years is quite a short space of time in marketing when you're talking about brand and brand strategy and changing people's perception. Because yeah. at the end of the day, that's what brand is, right? It's whatever lives in people's minds and their perception of you. But I had the first bit of feedback from my team where... They came back and they said, wow, people are actually coming up to us and saying, I know who you are. I know Avantra. You're the automation guys, aren't you? Or you're, you're the ones that do AI. And that's such a huge, I'm so proud of my team because I just think, yes, finally, from years of having salespeople come back and say, nobody knows who we are. All this money we're spending is pointless. Nobody listens to us. They don't know who we are. We don't know what we do. And then all of a sudden, it's this is why we keep chipping away 
at the brand awareness pillar of our marketing strategy. It's very easy within a small company, especially when you're investor owned as we are, to only listen to the noise that comes in about pipeline, revenue, growth, need it now, change. And actually, it's, we were smart enough to have one eye continually on brand awareness because we needed that air cover. Yeah. And four years in, it's starting to pay off because it does take time. Yeah, I just thought that was an interesting story for you is how, how things change. And four years isn't really that long in the grand scale, scheme of kind of brand strategy. So, yeah. No, that's brilliant, actually. And with respect to channels, like I understand you're doing webinars, you're doing physical events. Uh, yes. What other channels are you primarily leveraging? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So conferences is definitely at the moment the biggest spend within the marketing budget. But we also have quite a large chunk of money that we spend on content production. But that wouldn't just be, for example, white papers and articles and press. We're actually doing something with a partner at the moment called Tech Pros. And they're doing community-based marketing. Last year, it was all about ABM. This year, it's all about community-based marketing. And what's slightly different about that from account-based marketing is that you're actually trying to bring people together. So your industry peers, you bring them together. So say I've got, let's go back to Coca-Cola again. Say I've got a prospect of Coca-Cola and they're on my like target account list. So I want to go and get the get these people and bring in the business. Then... I need to look at similar businesses. And if I'm targeting the CIO, I want to go and look at the CIO of Pepsi. And I want to go and have a look at other bottling companies, or I want to go and have a look at other FMCG companies. And then what we do is we invite them all into a chat, what we call a challenge forum. Mm -hmm. So we get all these CIOs into one room and they're like, oh yeah, I want to go to that because I'm interested to know what Joe Bloggs's thoughts are on this particular challenge that we're having to deal with in SAP. And so when you get them on this challenge forum, they all submit something that's a bit of a pain point for them at the moment or a particular challenge. It might be, how do you move to the cloud? How do you deal with rise with SAP? Should you remain hybrid? Should you keep your legacy stuff on premise, et cetera? Right. So they all vote on which challenge they're going to discuss. And then as a, a group of peers, they come together and help each other to get through what their challenges might be. So they might be, oh yeah, I've got experience with that actually, this is what we did. And once you've got people engaged in that way, it's not a selling environment, it's actually a sort of value add, educational relationship building environment. So we're building those relationships and that gives us, that almost buys us the right to then go back to that participant and say, right. hey, you know, really appreciated your contribution there. Would you be interested in having a quick call with us? Because we think we might be able to help with some of the things that you raised. So you're stroking their ego a little bit, but you're connecting them with their peers. And only then are you suggesting that maybe there's a sales call to follow up after that. Now, because you have a very brilliant background in technical writing as well as SEO. Yes. I would, you know, any specific SEO strategies have been really helpful for you. Uh, in basically increasing your search visibility and generating traffic? Yeah. So I think there's probably a couple of key things, really. The first thing I would say is when you're doing your keyword research, try and think of that in terms of the questions that your ICP or your personas are going to ask. So mm -hmm. not just, not just for example, let's go with Coca-Cola again. So not just with, for example, oh, fizzy bottled drink. You want to go with things like, what is the best fizzy drink to offer at a party, for example? You want to go with those long tail questions because that allows you to provide more of an opinion. It means that your keyword is slightly more niche, so you've got more chance of being competitive in that field. Um, and it also offers something of value because we all know that the way that we use search engines now has changed. We used, I remember 20 odd years ago or 15 years ago, whenever typing into Google and being really clumsy with and just keyword stuffing to try and get as a prompt to try and get a result. But now we literally just use it as we use ChatGPT and other chatbots. And we're literally putting in there, where can I find X, Y, Z, da, da, da. We're very specific about our questions. So the more you can be specific with your content and your keyword research as to what does your audience really want to know, that allows you to carve out your niche and be a, th a thought leader then when you're putting your content strategy together. So that's probably the, the first thing I would say. And then there's another, there's a tool that can help you with that. So there's something called Ask Answer the, Ask the Public, I think it's called. It might be Answer the Audience. I'll, I'll find out and I'll let you know. But answer basically, the Public, I believe. 
answer the public. That's the one. Yeah, Neil Patel, isn't it? Yes. It's Neil Patel. That's behind, he's behind that, uh, that platform. It's a really good tool to use, again, to find, if you don't know what the questions are that people are asking that are within your personas, it will tell you. You put a few of your keywords in and it will start to give you ideas. And it's a bit like a hub and a spoke situation. So this is your main kind of question. Then off the back of that, oh, here's another question that somebody asks that's related. And then you can build your content framework around answering those. And then possibly the last thing, so I'll just give you three things there. The last thing I'd say on that as well is, and I actually wrote about this on a LinkedIn article just the other day, but when you're trying to be thought leaders within your kind of content program, mm -hmm. I would really suggest that you try and get your subject matter expert to agree on what their stance is. So if you are writing about, I don't know, let's go back to Coca-Cola again, why not? If you are writing about fizzy drinks, you need them to take a stance and have an opinion. And actually, the more controversial they can be, the better, because yep. that's what generates the interest. Uh, and the more people are likely to come on and comment and either agree or or disagree. So I'd strongly recommend trying to get your subject matter experts or your SMEs together in one room, talk mm -hmm. about one of your content strands and discuss together what is your stance, what's your angle, and try and be a bit more like a journalist and try and find out, okay, that's interesting. Whereas everything else that people have said is just ubiquitous. It's very kind of me too, and everybody's doing that. So try and find your difference, I would say. Oh, that's brilliant. And only one more thing, generating content definitely requires tons of effort and the right strategy. But then again, like making it successful, on, you need to take care of the offsite angle as well, right? Your link building, whatnot. Are you doing any such campaigns to increase, say, for example, your total number of referring domains or just getting the relevant backlinks pointing back to your blog articles or your service pages? Is it something which is on, uh, on your radar? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think... Building backlinks is one of the hardest things to do within an SEO strategy. It's really difficult. We tried various things. We've had websites where, for example, we worked with one SEO partner, had a large number of customers or clients, and they would use their own websites to build out content within the, those particular niches. And then they would post content on our behalf within those to get the domain authority up and push it back to our website. So that's one thing. We don't actually do much of that anymore. We actually find that it's better to dovetail it with your PR strategy. So we have a PR agency called BCM and we work with them to make sure that all of our pitched media and our editorials go out and have a backlink to our website and possibly even some embedded long tail backwards, backlink, sorry, to go to a specific deep page within our website. More often than not, some publications are very much no we don't do that that's not what we do but more often than not I find that 99% of them are like yeah sure of course we're yeah. happy to do that uh, and sometimes if you don't ask they won't even give you a link back to your main homepage. but you just have to ask so we're really keen to make sure that every single editorial pit pitch that goes out we include a link back to our own website mm -hmm. and then another interesting one to mention there's lots of other tricks and tips but just one thing that I think might be useful We've just started using a, a platform that allows us to bring all of our employees' LinkedIn accounts together. And okay. what we can do then is have a dashboard that says, this is your company's or your team's metrics. So this is your share of voice that you have as a whole company. This is how much network growth you've had in the last seven days. Mm -hmm. This is the number of comments or the number of invitations that you've sent. So it gives you that much wider visibility of, of the power of all of you together as brand ambassadors. And then you can break it down into different teams as well. So I can see, for example, within the leadership team, I'm one of the people that's got a top voice. I'm not the top voice, but I'm one of the people that's got a top voice. So again, how can I help other people within the business to generate their voice and get it higher up the rankings, if you like? And yeah. one of the things that we also do then within that platform is we follow the people that we know are influential within our space. So not necessarily the people we're trying to sell to, but uh -huh. the influential people. We follow them. And every time that person posts, it flags up in our system and you can integrate it to Slack as well. So it pings you a note. And then as an admin, I can say, boost this post, which basically pings out to everybody within, within our company to say, I need your help to swarm around this person's content. 
Uh, it might be mine, it might be somebody else in the business, but more often than not, it's somebody who's an influencer within our space. And then as many employees as possible, I would then hope would be going onto LinkedIn, would be responding to that person's article, and not just saying, hey, great article, but actually putting a comment that's actually intelligent, insightful, and ideally has a similar kind of alignment in messaging to all of the rest of the Avantrians, we call them people at Avantra. So then you just basically, you're, you're making sure that within that piece of content that's very influential, when you stream down the comments, you've just got a lot of different people from Avantra all saying something very similar and intelligent. And of course, it's linking back to their profile. So if I see an interesting comment, I always go and have a look at somebody's profile and go, oh, they look interesting. Mm -hmm. And if you set linked up, LinkedIn up properly, you'll have a call to action, call to action on there saying, visit my website. Yep. So every single one of our employees are saying, visit my website and putting intelligent content on LinkedIn. That's creating much more traffic back to our website and increasing our share of voice. That's so, intelligent. Yeah. That's intelligent. Uh, awesome. <laughs> I would love to understand, Emily, now, like how exactly is the churn rate in your company? And are there any specific strategies uh, that have been really fruitful for you when it comes to your client retention side of things? Mm, yeah, so client retention is really interesting. For us, we've actually got one of the highest NPS scores within our space. We're plus 65. And SAP, for example, I think they might even have stopped tracking it because it's not very good. <laughs> and it goes from it goes to plus 100 and then to minus 100. So being plus 65 is, is very good. And we also have about a 99% renewal rate. So once people buy from us, they continue to renew year on year. And yeah. we actually say we had on the, the Vegas conference that we've got going on right now, We've got a big kind of splash on our booth saying more people renew with Avantra than any other vendor in this space. Come and ask us why. And one of the main reasons is because you've got a quality product. You've got to keep your brand promises, right? We've got a quality product. We have a lot of possible features, which means that people can use it in the way it's not. It's not shoehorning them into a particular way of working. If you take mm -hmm. HubSpot. HubSpot off the shelf, for example, it's very rigid. There are a few things that you can change or you can buy more modules, but ultimately it's, it's like a standard box of tools. Whereas with our platform, you get those out of the box things, but then you can also extend and build on top of it with sort of automation recipes, if you like. Sure. And so that's one thing that goes down very well with our customers. And we have a customer council as well. So we bring our customers together. We get their input in what they want to see in terms of new functionality, as well as looking at what the market is wanting. So at the moment, the market's definitely going towards Gen AI. So we're looking at them building our own co-pilots. We've just launched the concept, which is called Avantra Air, a bit like being able to have some sort of chat GPT on your shoulder saying, did you know that you've got a problem here? Here's how you could maybe fix it. Or do you want to schedule a maintenance window? Because we can see an opportunity over here. Do you want to go and do that? So we've got some interesting things in development with our with our AI um, product, which we're probably going to do as a separate SaaS product, actually. And so the fact that we have a co-innovation with our customers is really important. Quite often we'll work with a particular customer because they want a specific set of functionality. And if it makes sense to do it because the rest of our customer base will benefit, then we'll do it. So that's one thing. And I think the, the last thing I would mention as well is that just the, the customer support is fantastic. It's really exceptional customer support. We're always getting great feedback about we jump on it. We rescue people when there's a crisis and we make sure that they understand how to fix it in the future. We're, we're teaching them to, to fish, not just giving them that fish. So, yeah. That's fine. Now, looking ahead, what trends are you basically foresee in AI ops and SaaS operations space? And how exactly your company is preparing to adapt to these changes? Yeah, so we've actually just employed a head of AI. Okay. Um, and our head of AI has got some fantastic ideas about where he wants to take the product. Uh, and it's all very exciting. I think what our customers are probably really keen for is this SaaS offering. At the moment, for example, when you buy our products, we need to go and put an agent on your server. So you can't just put in your credit card and go, hey, I want to buy Avantra today. Yes, I'll go and have that, thanks. So being able to offer some sort of SaaS element 
where people can, more junior members of staff, for example, can go and say, oh, yes, I want to buy the Avantra AI co-pilot, Avantra Air, I want to go and buy that. And then they can. And it also means that we're giving our customers freedom of choice. It's up to them whether they go to the cloud, whether they stay on premise or whether they're hybrid. Whichever they want to do, we're agnostic, but we'll support them in their journey wherever they're going to go. So I think that's something probably that the market is going to have to look at, especially in our space. So SAP is an example, hugely successful business. But I think they've become slightly to some of the requirements that the market is asking for. And just getting people to sign up to these really huge contracts and then they're locked in. And actually they're then saying, well, actually, we're not going to help you with innovation unless you're on one of our big contracts. So I think being able to off- offer flexibility to customers, depending on how they want to, basically how they want to carve out their future as a business. There's some businesses that just will not move to the cloud. They just don't want to. They've got too much important data. For whatever reason, they can't put it in the cloud. And I don't think we can shut people out from that. But sometimes I think that some of the larger businesses like SAP are making those decisions for their customers and Mm -hmm. it starts to not feel quite, quite right. What we want to make sure that we do within the market is make sure we offer that flexibility, create products that people really want to buy and allow them to have that freedom of choice. AI is definitely here to stay. It's not going away. But we also, I think, we need to be really careful. There's obviously a much bigger ethical discussion about AI within the different spaces. But within SAP operations, within IT operations, is actually something that's really beneficial. And like I said earlier, it's there to help people to reduce the number of repetitive, boring tasks and do some interesting things. Very intelligent people that do some really important work. And then you have better talent retention. You attract better people. And I think AI and AI ops is only just starting in the kind of SAP space. But out there in the wider world, it's obviously going at a great pace. And I think there's like hundreds of businesses starting up each week just in the UK with some element of AI within their product. So, yeah, it's quite a fascinating space at the moment. So, Emily, I would love to understand, are there any new marketing initiatives that you're planning for this year, really excited about? Yeah, so we're actually starting to embark on a project where we're looking at our brand narrative. As I mentioned to you, to, to you before about that first conference that I went to, we didn't know what we were, who to, you know, what to say, what our messaging was. Um, and we've been working on that. We've done some great work on our personas and we've really got to understand what it is that the, the pain is within our ICP. And so now what I'm doing with my team is actually working on the strategic brand narrative, making sure that we understand this, as I mentioned before, this rallying cry. What as a, as a business, what is our rallying cry? What are we calling people to come and join? What's the revolution? Mm-hmm. Uh, And then my team can make sure that we take that on and activate that in the market, but also so that we work with HR and the people team to make sure that people understand what our brand promise is so that there's alignment up and down the spine of the business. Because when you have that alignment, people then can, they they know what they're doing in their, they know how to make decisions in their daily work. Because they're thinking, oh, yes, this is why we're here. This is what we do. And it's beyond making money. It's actually the purpose of why we're here. And then every decision they make, regardless of what function they're in, whether they're in IT, HR, marketing, or finance, they can base their decisions on that brand promise and think, yes, that's why we're doing this. That's why we're going forward. And so that's a project I'm working on at the moment. I'm really excited. I'm working with an external brand consultant that's used to this space and what we do. And we've got a workshop planned in Philadelphia in a few months. So I'm really excited about that. And yeah, it's just it's just a really good growth time, I think, in, in the market. And I'm really excited about it. Brilliant. Right, Emily, we're coming to an end. And I would love to have a quick rapid fire with you. I'm ready for that. Let's go for it. Okay. What habit holds you back the most? Overthinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want an explanation or is it that rapid fire? You can explain this. No, I would love to know why exactly is it holding you back? Yeah, yeah. I think that I have, a, as a person, I have a tendency to overanalyze wow. every single thing. And sometimes you just need to be bold and go out there. So I think rather than overthink it, be bold, push forward and go and do it. Because you can always seek forgiveness rather than permission. Ooh, makes sense. 
Okay. What chore do you absolutely despise doing? Sorry, say that again. What chore do you absolutely despise doing? Budget tracking. Huh? Spreadsheets. Hate spreadsheets. Awesome. What subject do you find to be most fascinating? Brand and brand strategy. Yeah. I just find it absolutely fascinating how you can, the psychology of it, how you can shape people's perception of, of what you are. Yeah. Right. What career did you dream of having as a kid? Don't say brand manager. <laughs> oh, no, definitely not. I wanted to be a singer. Oh. I did. Did, did, I did you try your luck? I did. When I was at university, I was in a I was in a band and we actually got on Spotify. We're still yeah. there if we look hard enough today. And we had quite a few gigs around London and Oxford. So, yeah, I did it. Nothing major came of it. So I went and got a proper job. <laughs> Right. What did you last search on Google? Oh, I think I searched, this is really boring, but I searched for a book, a marketing book by Martin Neumier, and I couldn't remember the name of it, so I wanted to search for it. Okay. That's quite boring, isn't it? <laughs> anything that resonates with marketing is interesting for our audience. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Emily. Really appreciate your time here and all the valuable insights that you have say, uh, shared on this session. Truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you.